Wichita Liberty TV, featuring host Bob Weeks. Local politics without the spin. Interviews with nationally respected economists. Hear directly from Kansas conservatives about what matters to you. It's individual liberty, limited government, and free markets. Wichita Liberty TV. Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Kansas and Wichita government and public affairs. We're broadcast on Great Plains Television, that's channel 26.1, Sunday morning at 8.30, repeated again at 4.30 in the afternoon. You can also find Wichita Liberty TV at my site, that's the Voice for Liberty at wichitaliberty.org. You'll find all the episodes of Wichita Liberty TV there, show notes for each episode, and then all the other material that I and others produce at wichitaliberty.org each week. Well, before we start today's episode, I just want to recognize and give a shout out to the Wichita Pachyderm Club. Last week, the National Federation of Pachyderms Club had, had their convention, and the Wichita Pachyderm Club won four awards, including that of Most Outstanding Club. So congratulations to the leadership of the club and all the members of the board and the volunteers that make the Wichita Pachyderm Club, I really think, one of our city's most treasured civic institutions. If you want to learn more about the Wichita Pachyderm Club, there's a Facebook page for him. It's a friendly club. Meetings are open to everybody. Lunchtime on Fridays in the, uh, well, the Ruffin Building, the old Bank of America Building. Although the meetings cost $15 for non-members, but you do get lunch for that. And Carl, uh, Peter John co-host, you've been on the board of the Pack Durham Club for a long time. What do you think about these awards? I think it's a tremendous recognition for some incredible folks who've done some wonderful work in terms of trying to increase public awareness on very important Kansas and national issues and also local issues. Uh, Pachyderm Club is an incredible resource for this community. Yeah, I think it is. Well, thanks for your work you've done on the board of that over the years. Anyway, for today, our special guest is uh, Leo Delperdang. He's a member of the Kansas House of Representatives for District 94. That's in Wichita, west of Mays Road, and from a little bit south of Kellogg up to 29th Street North along through there, and this is his first term. So, Representative Delperdang, welcome to Wichita Liberty TV. Thank you for having me on the show today. So, uh, first term, first session. Before mm -hmm. that, you'd been in the private sector. What's it like working in the public sector for a change? Yeah, it's a little bit different. You uh, Private sector, you're, you've got your kind of set hierarchy that you report up through. Uh, public sector, you try and please the majority each time, but you mm -hmm. remember each time you push a button there, you're not pleasing 100% of them. Your so voting button, is that you were talking that's about? That's what I yeah. mean, the voting button. Mm -hmm. And through the through the session time, the skin has to get a little thicker. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's been an interesting experience, one that uh, I appreciate having the opportunity to experience. Okay, well, so as a new member of the legislature, you know, we hear a lot of people say, well, it takes them like, you know, six months to just to learn where the restrooms are, and they really can't. I think what they're talking about is the idea that legislature is complex, legislative procedure is complex and confusing, laws of the state are complex, and it takes a long time for new members to learn enough to really get anything done. Do, do you agree with that assessment? It varies by individual legislator. Uh, there were some things that, for, in my case, I picked up on right away. There's stuff that I'm still learning. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a whole wealth of rules through the House that you have to know and comply with, know when you can uh, push something through, when to speak, etc. cetera. Um, so it's a learning experience. Uh, mm -hmm. They tend to say the freshmen's, the best mode is to go up there and observe and kind of stay out of it and I did that for the first month or two and then started learning my way around and getting a little more involved. And I think that uh, there were quite a few new members of the legislature both in the House and the Senate mm -hmm. this year. Most of those I don't want to say all, but a great deal of them came through on this kind of wave of moderate or dem even democratic, but you have held to a, cons a fiscally conservative voting line, so you were really kind of the exception to the rule of the new members. Is that fair to say? That would be very fair to say. Mm -hmm. um, Good. Th that was something that almost got me in trouble with one of the leaderships there. Um, they, they had a, a ball the freshmen out one night. And they went around the table and they asked us all the same question. Mm -hmm. That question was, what surprises you most about the legislature being a freshman? 
they didn't like my answer. My answer was that the Republicans occupy the majority of the chairs, but they're in the minority. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the proper answer. <laughs> I think so. he's by that he's talking about Carl, the well-known uh, moderate or left-wing Republicans. We might say, is yes. that it? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes pejoratively called the rhinos. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But Leo, uh, the question I'd have as a new legislator: sometimes it said your most important vote is the vote that you cast before you even take office. Did that? Did you feel like that was the case this year for your vote when you were voting for leadership in December or November before before you actually got sworn into office but after you were elected? Yes, it was. Um, I, knew, I knew going up there who I wanted to vote for, who I wanted to see as the leadership, and that did not necessarily play out throughout the, uh, the session. So I, I had cast my vote for certain ones and Basically, one or two of those actually got into leadership. Let me ask you, because the public doesn't that understand idea it. For, okay. for a moment there, we're going to take our first commercial break, and then when we get back, we'll get to Carl's question for our guest, Representative Leo Delbert. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks with Carl Peter John and our guest, State Representative Leo Delportain. Carl, you had a question? Yes, uh, we were talking about how leadership is selected before you actually take office. Mm -hmm. Now, how is that conducted and is it an open ballot or a secret ballot? Okay, it's really a secret ballot and you're up there essentially almost the day before the session really takes off. and they will have a, a separate election for each of the leaderships, whether it be speaker, the majority leader, the, the whip, et cetera, et cetera. And How many positions are there? There's about five or six. There's I want to the, say the, the conference chair or some other, anyway. But yeah, the speaker, speaker pro tem. Speaker is really the big one, I think. Yeah. And the Senate so, president for the other side. And that's on the other side, mm -hmm. yes. But it's done by uh, private ballot, and each one comes up. Secret ballot. Secret ballot, yes. You write it on a piece of paper, you fold it, and one by one you go up and drop it in a ballot box. So you don't know what the person next to you really voted for. What happens if there's three or four candidates? Then if there's a tie as it goes through, then they will redo those two who tied, if, assuming they were a, a, the winning tie. Okay. So if there's three candidates and one gets, I'm going to say, 10 votes and the other one gets 30 and 30, for example, then the two that tied toward the, at the top, they will redo the vote on those mm -hmm. and they will And it's the it. entire membership of the House voting, yes, not it just is. the Republicans or no, the majority it, yeah. the party. So the Speaker is important because he does, after all, chair the meetings of the legislature, although we often uses a, a an agent to do that for him, but also setting up the membership of all the committees too, is that correct? He controls who does the uh, chairmanships of each of the committees and who com who is composed of the committees. The speaker also sets what bills come above the line that actually get worked. So, yeah, but so well, let's, the, uh, if, Bob, I want to clarify yeah. because I think we may have created a little bit of confusion here. The Republicans caucus separately from the Democrats and they each put together who they're going to nominate for speaker, correct? There's the... I mean, we were talking about all the members voting as opposed to the members of the Democrat caucus or the Re right. Republican caucus the voting The Democratic separately. caucus will vote for who is the minority leader, mm -hmm. et cetera, over there. Their leaders. The yeah. Republicans will vote for who is the majority leaders. If but the will. speaker is voted on by the entire House membership. I believe so. I believe so, yeah. yeah. That's the way it is in the United States House yeah. anyway. That, yeah. uh, Nancy Pelosi came in second to Paul Ryan this year, so mm -hmm. uh, that there. Um, so we oftentimes hear criticism of members. People, well, if they're not happy with the member's vote, they'll say, he just voted the way leadership wanted. Is that 
a valid criticism or does that happen a lot? What's the relationship between a member such as yourself and the leadership of the, of the chamber? There are times that I will see some members vote with leadership if they're trying to get a certain thing through. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to say that the vast majority of the time I have voted for what I heard coming out of my district. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little unique with that because each week we do get letters up there. I mean, tremendous amounts of letters. You get your form letters. Talking about email or postal you, letters. You get letters to the postal, you get emails, etc. And the ones that are individual, I tend to throw them in what I call my take home visit mm -hmm. box. And when we're home on the weekends, I will actually go out and pound doors hmm. and follow up with the people who took the time to write me. My attitude on that is, I was willing to take their time during campaign season to go knock on their door. So when they need something from me, by golly, I ought to be able to show up at their door at that point in time too. So you can tell the difference between a personal letter versus these, you know, these machine generated things where you fill out a yeah. form and send. You can tell the difference and I imagine. Uh, do you also, what about, do you read letters from everybody or do you give more weight to the people who are in your district? Well, I give a lot more weight to the people in my district. Mm -hmm. Generally, the ones outside your district are the, as you call it, the machine generated. They, you get a thousand letters they all say the exact same thing right. but it'll have their name and city below at the bottom and apparently my district ranges from Goodland all the way to Kansas City because you get them from all over. I've had a few out of Wisconsin. I've even had a few from Europe. So I've got a really big district. On, on, on what subjects were you getting letters from Europe? Just the important ones, the, the ra don't raise my taxes, the expansion of the Medicaid pro and con, you know, the, the major votes. Mm -hmm. They were coming from every direction. The um, budget bill that uh, you voted on, I noticed that you voted against it. There were only about 20 some that voted against it. Uh, one of the things that really irritated me is that the governor in his proposed budget said, we can save $47 million if we consolidate the way school districts get their health insurance mm -hmm. for their employees. Well, that didn't happen. And so we had to add back $47 million to general fund $89 million for the next year mm -hmm. in order to do something that the, uh, well, I, I want to ask you, why didn't that get done? It seemed like such an easy thing, but we are going to take a moment off for a commercial break. We'll be back with more Wichita Liberty TV in just a moment. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks with co-host Carl Peter John, State Representative Leo Delperdang. So a bill to save a lot of money didn't happen. What, what was the reason why that didn't happen? I, you, there's different factions that are at work constantly up there. Whether it's, in that case, whether it was the Kansas Association of School Boards, whether it was unions, I, I can't an, cannot answer that one. Uh, I've seen various numbers. Some, like, like you said, in the 40 million range, I've seen some say in 63 million, I've seen some up pressing the 80 million marker. Serious but amounts of money. Serious amounts of money that we should have looked at prior to even considering any tax increases. Just, that should have went after first. Mm -hmm. And in some of these cases, like you mentioned, the insurances for the, the schools, each school district, and there's just under 300 school districts, they each negotiate their own benefits packages. They each negotiate their own insurances. In the case of a big one like Wichita schools, they're big. They can do that. I've, I've got no quarrel there. But when you get into some of these school districts that may be 100, 200 in size, they don't have enough quantity to demand the discounts. Now, Leo, please clarify, when you say 100 to 200, are we talking students or school district employees? Oh, we're talking employees. Mm -hmm. okay. So, and we've got a lot thinking, that are even I was thinking smaller. there were some school districts that had only a couple hundred students. There sure is. And you'd have even there fewer sure numbers of employees. Yes, there sure is. But, but you take that, and it's okay, let's take the, the really small districts that maybe has 20 employees or 30 employees, how do you negotiate a really decent discount with the insurances? Mm -hmm. It's just not feasible. Yeah. 
And the, so the, the vested interests, I think the school districts and maybe others, they just didn't want to do that. Is that basically what it comes down to? I, I, I hate to speak for them, but I'm, I'm personally disgusted that we could not have done that. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're talking about so much money on the line, Leo, uh, the thing that I think is rather interesting is we've had a nationalization of insurance coverage and mm -hmm. under Obamacare, and this is an effort in, in a way to centralize and, and generate savings that Obamacare didn't have at the national level to try that at the state. It and, absolutely and, and, is. And we went in the exact opposite direction of trying to save money um, and just treated it the taxpayers' money like it was um, confetti. Yeah, it, it, that's one example of it. I mean, in the case of being able to whether the school districts wanted to buy from it or not, why couldn't we get together, set up a state contract mm -hmm. for the insurances? And then we can go out to you, Mr. Superintendent, here's what the state contract is for the exact same insurance your, your teachers and employees have now versus yours, mm -hmm. and um, let you choose. Which one makes sense to you? When I was a county commissioner, the county was able to segue off of state contracts on Absolutely. purchases of uh, office supplies and that sort of thing. Now let me ask you, as a new legislate, legislator and you had the opportunity to not only observe but to participate, carrying legislation is an important role. Did you carry any bills during the 2017 legislative yes, session? Yes, I did. And there, that, there wasn't a whole bunch of freshmen that did that, but um, I was able to get two bills carried through. One is fully passed and signed into law. Mm -hmm. That was known as the Law Enforcement Protection Act. And that stimulated back, I went to a graduation with the uh, Kansas Highway Patrol okay. back on December 8th of 16. And the, the uh, commencement speech was done by Derek Schmidt, our attorney general up there. And during that speech, he talked about there's gaps in the current laws regarding protection for law enforcement officers. What's that mean? Crimes that are committed against the, the officers strictly because they carry a badge. You know, gee, someone you arrested my so sister. Like retaliation. Or something. Yeah, retaliation. You re, you arrested my sister, so by golly, I'm going to come after you. Mm -hmm. And there there was some severe gaps in those laws that Derek Schmidt talked about. So after that, I got with him and said he he'd been trying to get this through the legislature for a couple of years. I said, you've got my ears, you've got my attention. Let's make this thing happen this year. And we walked it through. It got some very contentious debate on the floor, hmm. very much so. But it ended up passing. Well, how close was the vote? I want to say it was 115 to about 10 when we were mm -hmm. done. Yeah. But there was a lot of debate on Is there. Is this one where sometimes you have a committee of the whole vote where maybe 63, 62, and then when yes. it gets to final passage and it's a recorded vote, it's yes. 115 to 9? Yeah. But it was, don't hold me to that number, that's off the top of my head, okay. but I could look that up to get you the exact. Mm -hmm. um, but it went from the House, it went over to the Senate, got held up back and forth there, it eventually passed the Senate, mm -hmm. and was signed into law approximately a month ago by the governor. So that one was done, and what that did is actually up the grid for the penalties for anybody creating crimes against a law enforcement officer simply because they carry that badge. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. When we come back, I want to talk a bit more about that uh, process because I think we could learn a little bit more about what it takes to, to actually make the law in the Kansas legislature. So we'll be back again in just a moment. Welcome back again to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks with Carl Peter John, our guest Leo Delperdang of the Kansas House of Representatives. So you talked about a bill that you were the impetus for. There's another one too about aviation. Um, you know, a bill has to be written in certain legalistic language, referencing this old bill and it strikes out and amends and so forth. How does that work get done? If you have an idea, how does that yeah. legal language get started? <laughs> that was my biggest concern going up there because I do not hold a, lo a law degree. I'm, I'm business background, but it go. we've got attorneys that sit on each of the committees. Mm -hmm. Now, in the case of this Law Enforcement Correct, uh, Protection Act, it came out of the Corrections Committee that I sit on. Juvenile, corrections and juvenile. And 
the attorneys that are on that or part of that committee staff, mm -hmm. they will work with like the revisor's office and so forth to take what we would call plain language and turn it into the le legal language of the bills. And then we get a copy of that bill. Um, I will generally read through all of the bill. Uh, you've, you can also get a bill brief, which kind of gets the, I'm going to call it the cleft notes version of it. These are the fiscal notes and the supplemental then there's a notes fiscal that are note. produced by legislative research? Yes, the mm -hmm. fiscal notes gets into, if you pass this bill, here's how much it's going to cost the state. And those fiscal notes and supplemental notes are usually posted on the legislature's website pretty quickly. So mm -hmm. not only is the text of a bill, but then these explanatory things. And you mentioned a certain office, the reviser, and I think some people hear about that, but the reviser's office is really important because that office is the custodian of our state's laws. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Yes, they are. And if you want to inject law into that system, it's got to be, you know, section so and so is modif is amended and stricken, and all that has to work out. Otherwise, the laws may not actually do what you intended for them to that do. That is a true statement. Plus, they also look at the I'm going to call it the cause and effect. If I change law X Y Z on this bill, does it affect? A law similar on a different bill, mm -hmm. and they they will do the mismatching and the and the, the the alignment there to to find the cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Avoid the mismatches, thing. I presume, yes. as opposed to creating. But them. they have to find them first. Do they kind of provide <laughs> so, advice, like suppose you wanted to propose something that was uh, against the Kansas or United States Constitution? Absolutely. They would, okay, they did. Absolutely. There. Yeah, well, very good. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what about this aviation bill? Because right? that's a big topic down here, of course, in South Yes, Central it is, uh, especially with some of the, it sounds like there's some more layoffs being announced here within the aviation sector. I heard oh, just the other day. Unfortunate. But several years ago, I want to say 2008, Oklahoma passed a bill that would provide credits for, in the, for students going to school for aviation related. And I don't care if that's a certificate, if it was a two-year degree, if it's a four-year master's degree, they also provided credits to the employers who would hire these students after mm -hmm. the fact. That was part of the reason that we lost Boeing, a lot of Boeing workers down to Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. So I was one of them that went after the bill down there from Oklahoma, mimicked it up here working with the, the uh, legal advisors and the revisors office, office, et cetera, and put it together and carried that to the floor. Mm -hmm. Once again, that was met with a lot of debate because it was a sector where we were pulling out a sector, but it was statistically shown it was going to create upwards of a thousand jobs per mm -hmm. year, paying from 52,000 to 100,000 a year in Wichita, in Salina, and some of the outlying parts that, because it wasn't just aircraft companies, it was aircraft related. So if okay. you've got a small company making All parts for ecosystem, that, everybody, yeah. yes. Um, that made it through the House, it made it through the Senate. Where I'm a little disgusted is it got tied in with the tax increase bills. So it was kind of, it was held hostage. I if see. you want this into effect, by golly, you're gonna have to vote to increase taxes. So and really, this is, this is a type of horse, really horse trading that we hear about. That's is that exactly really what it. happened? That's exactly mm. it. And was the, this occurring sometimes in the wee hours of the morning too? It was. It occurred several times. <laughs> the or, tax or bill that occurred continuously yes. over a period of time. The tax bill that you finally seen come out for the one point two billion dollars was, I want to say, number four. It started out much lower. 3 and 5 percent, then it jumped to 5.3 percent on the upper end, and 5.6 percent, including the, the aviation and the Ad Astra bill, which mm -hmm. was for economic development out in outstate Kansas. And then in the last minutes, they pulled all those out and cranked the price, the rates up even more on the tax bill and ran it through. They were doing that in order to get moderate and Democrat votes that they needed to get through. So some conservatives Who's have they? told me that, uh, <laughs> well they've <laughs> told me that they went ahead and voted for this tax bill mm -hmm. uh, because it kept what was being proposed in these iterations kept getting worse and worse and yes, worse they, and they felt it was time to call an end to it and let's just get out of it. That again. is an absolute true statement because I too was in fear if this, if it didn't make it through on this one. There was several people out there that was pushing for 5.9, upwards of 6.25% 6 increase. So why were you able to vote against the tax bills and against the, uh, uh, or in, 
uh, when we say override, there's a double negative there. In other words, you were not in favor of any of the higher tax bills, but yet some of your neighboring representatives, I think, were. What's the difference there, do you think? To me, it was an easy answer. And it wasn't what Leo wanted. I've told everybody, I went up there with the title of representative. Mm -hmm. And when you get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters from your district saying, do not raise the taxes, what do you think I'm going to do? Mm -hmm. I am not going to raise the taxes. I'm there to represent the district. So I guess that's a, testimo a testimony uh, to uh, get involved and keep in touch with yes. your legislators and maybe you'll have some influence on that legislation. They absolutely do. Well, Representative Leo Delperdang, we are out of time for today. So thanks very much for appearing on Wichita Liberty TV. Carl, thank you for your contribution. We'll see you again with another episode next week.